I'm going to read to you a passage from Psalm 138, Psalm 138, beginning in verse 5. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Uh, we were talking just before church of the things that have changed through the years. And when you see, you come to a church, new church, or you visit a church, and I remember the first time I saw courses off the wall. And uh, uh, there's been improvements with that. And this morning we were talking about uh, the communion cups. And if you did not pick up one, they're on, in a basket on the table in the foyer. And uh, we'll have communion at the end of our service today. If you want to pick that up at, at your convenience before the end of the service. But we sing because we are very happy to know the Lord and very blessed at what he does for us. It makes us want to sing. Amen? So yes, we sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. But the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And if you remember in Genesis, it says God spoke and framed the worlds and spoke into existence everything that exists except for man. And he took the dust of the earth in his hands shaped man, and breathed into man a living soul. Isn't that wonderful that it says, do not forsake the works of your hands. How many would testify that the Lord is good? Amen. He is a wonderful heavenly father, a true and faithful friend. One of our family here at the church, Debbie Crimmins, is in the hospital, and she is not doing well. She has come down with COVID. Her heart is working very poorly. And we really need to pray that the Lord will give her peace and comfort, keep her from suffering. Amen. And uh, I know that there's many others. You can look and there's many people that are normally here that are not. Some of them are sick. Some of them are away. But we appreciate you being here. And I'd like for you to join us for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne today so thankful and grateful for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming to your house today. And thank you so much for meeting with us. Your word declares that where even two or three gather in your name, there you will be in their midst. And we welcome you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've prepared for your people today. Receive our worship as we lift our voices together in song. And while we are here, Lord, would you minister encouragement and healing and comfort to those that are struggling today. Lift them up, help them to sense your peace and your presence. And we will be so faithful to thank you for your help and for all that you do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to stand as we worship, you're welcome to do so.
want you to get this in your heart. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfair. Scripture says that God will not fail, not one word of all his promises. He will not fail, not one word of all of his promises. The promises of the Lord are yes, and so be it to them that believe. Amen. So you hold on. Hold on to his promise. You're going to see the enemy take off and run. And you're going to see the victory. Amen. Thank you, Don, for your help this morning. I got to uh, briefly uh, see. I did not get to meet. She came. Uh, she said she woke up in the morning sick. This is uh, the lady who is the superintendent of schools for Cochise County, was the speaker. And you talk uh, about a powerhouse. Uh, she's short, probably about that tall, and a grandmother of 21. And uh, <laughs> that's, I think she said she had seven kids, but she said her day started out horrible, and it went the whole day horrible. And then it started raining, and she got here late, and it rained the whole time that we were hosting the event. But she really shared her testimony and her commitment to the Lord. And I thought for kids to hear that in the climate that we are in in our world, to see a leader of education say that her number one commitment and relationship was with the Lord and to his kingdom and to ministry. And she said, the other is my job, but my number one commitment. I thought that was just awesome. But anyway, we, we took some pictures. Maybe we can get those uh, on the media and have those before church next week and uh, you'll get to see a little bit of it. How many of you know there are power, there is power in words? There is power in words. I want to talk to you about word power. Proverbs 18, verse 20 and 21, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about that. Death and life, verse 21 of Proverbs 18, are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. One of the things that I think it's so important to pick up from Proverbs 18, 20, and 21 is that when we talk, that's what we're feeding our spirit and our mind and our emotions on, is how we talk. And the way we talk is affected by the way we feel and what we're thinking. And it says that's what fills our belly and that we will eat the fruit of what we say. Think about that a moment. What you say with your mouth can either bring death or life. Are you with me? Nod your head, wave your hand, kick your foot, something to let me know you're, you're, you're able to hear me. Proverbs 15, verse 21 through 26. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. But a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. 
and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Due season, right time. There's a time to speak and a time to be quiet. Amen? But verse 23, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Pure motive, virtuous thought. He says they are pleasant words. Then let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. The book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first begin to be spoken by the Lord. What we have that is called the Bible was first spoken by the Lord. He was the living Word. And God breathed into the heart and mind of those who wrote the Old Testament and the New. Amen, church? This is God spoken. And it says, and listen to this. How shall we neglect if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first begin to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And we read a moment ago to take earnest heed of the words that we have heard. The Bible teaches us that when we stand before God, we will give an answer not only for what we say, but we will give an answer for what we have heard. So when you come to the house of the Lord or you listen to ministry and you hear the word of the Lord, the Bible says we become without excuse because God spoke it and then he sent the Holy Spirit to repeat it into our mind and our heart and we will give an answer for that which we have heard. As I was thinking and preparing the message, I also thought we will also give an answer for the things that we chose to listen to. We will give an answer for those that we have listened to instead of listening to the Lord in prayer and meditation and waiting. If we just spend our time listening to others, we're going to give an answer for that. Amen? Amen. Now I know that you may not know, but I know that's my grandson. But I want you as a congregation to understand through all the years we have welcomed babies and children into the church. We feel like it is a sacred appointment 
from the time they are born to be in the presence of God. So I don't want you to be discomforted. And I, I've told Jordan and Jessica, I want them to be at ease in bringing him in. Amen? He is our grandson and their son, and that kind of puts us in the emotional hot seat because we know everybody knows, well, why don't they take that baby out? Well, I have invited all the babies that have ever been born in this congregation for now 30 years and encouraged them to keep them in here. Even during times we had nursery and children's church, you're always welcome to take them out if you feel that's necessary. But they are a part of the family. Amen. And they need to grow up and understand what's happening in, in the sanctuary. So when they grow older, they'll not only know what's going on and be familiar with it, but they'll be at peace with it. Amen. So I just share that because he was trying to help me preach. Uh, he's far more responsive than some of you are. <laughs> <laughs> verse 4 of Hebrews 2 God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will so God says he does not only speak to us and there is power in what he says and then he gives us an understanding what to look for. Well, how do we know there's power? Because God bears witness of what he says with signs, wonders, divers' miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So I want you to, I want you to be open and learn to have a comfort level with the working and administration of the Holy Spirit. We're living in a time where religious people have become very uncomfortable with the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Take your time to look in the New Testament and examine not only the fruit of the Holy Spirit, there are nine of them, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And many of those gifts are gifts of utterance. And it is very uncomfortable to the flesh. It is almost craziness to the unbeliever. The Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit and the presence and working of the Spirit is life and breath to the church. If we're going to have spiritual vibrancy and vitality, we must be open and cooperative with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because those are spoken and words have power. And they are given to us as a sign and an evidence that God means what he says. Amen? Now let's go to the Old Testament, Job chapter 15. Eliphaz is talking to Job and he's accusing Job of folly. Verse 1, chapter 15 of Job. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? It's what we might call today bloviating. We just start talking and we just keep talking. Doesn't even mean that we know what we're talking about, but we're doing a lot of talking. It's another word for hot air. But listen to what he says here. Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? <laughs> I had to laugh a little bit as I read that because I've, I've listened to a lot of that through the years. Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God. For your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. So Eliphaz 
was talking to Job. And you remember one of the things he says, I regret the day that I was born in my mother's womb. And he said, Job, have you forgotten who you are and who God is? Just because of the trouble that's come up on you, have you totally abandoned what you know to be true and right? Are you going to listen to the negative and the dark and the desperate and the defeat and the attacks of the enemy? Verse 7, Job 15. Are you the first man who was born, or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. Verse 11, this is important. Are the consolations of God too small for you? And the word spoken gently with you? Now that's important. Because what it's saying, is this insignificant? Is this too small and unimportant that we can just cast it aside during the week or while we're in the sanctuary and we have a passage to examine that we just leave our Bibles at home or don't open it. Is this insignificant in importance and value? That's what verse 11 is, seven, uh, 11 is saying. Are the consolations of God too small for us? Are we looking for someone else to say something more important than what God has already said? That would be folly, wouldn't it? That would be foolishness. Why does your heart carry you away? And isn't that what happens? How many have had your heart carry you away? Everything's going all right, something happens, and it gets into your heart, and immediately... Your mind, your emotions, everything about you just is taken away from where you were the moment before. And now you are in turmoil, you are in sorrow, you are in anger, all the emotions that can come. And look at why does your heart carry you away? Now let's pause for a moment. How many remember what happened to Job? Have you heard it, read it? His children die when the house that they were in partying and fellowshipping with one another caved in on them, killed them all. Immediately, people from all around Job's property begin to come and steal from him his grain, his livestock, and all that he had was either burned or stolen. Then he comes down with a health issue that covers him with sore boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet to where he could not function but set by a fire that had burned out and left ash which would be clean. And he would pack the open sores completely from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And then his wife says, you are a fool for trusting in what God has told you. Look at what has happened to our family and now has happened. Why don't you just curse God and die? That's the basic story of Job. Eliphaz is saying, Job, even though these things are happening, don't you forget who God is and what God has told you. It would be foolish for you, Job, to do that. And Job says to his wife, even if the skin worms end up devouring my whole body, in that happening, I will still see God. Now we're talking about word power. Eli uh, Eliphaz is saying to Job, Job, don't forget what God has told you. Don't forget what God has done, how he has walked with you. 
when the blessing was there. Don't forget that. Don't put what God has said into the basket of not important anymore because of what you're going through. It's more important in the time of trouble than it's ever been. Amen? One word spoken in due season can bring life in the midst of death. If spoken from God, it will be the only word you need to hear. A word can turn defeat into victory. It can turn confusion into clarity. A word spoken at the right time can turn despair into peace. Or those same words can too often do the very opposite if our heart is not in the right place. For a child who does something that is inappropriate at the most inopportune time to hear from an adult, especially family members, you are so stupid. It may have been an inopportune and wrong thing to do and may have met the qualification of the definition of stupidity. But because of what the word said and the inflection of it, it was more the embarrassment to the person who saw what happened than it was correction and instruction to a child that needs to learn. How many can see what I'm talking about? So it's not only important the word to be said, to be spoken, correction when it's needed. So important. Just as important how we say it. There was your opportunity so far, one of the greater opportunities to say, Amen. I need to remember that. But we all need to remember that. When God speaks, His speaking is intended to take us from sin and darkness, despair, sorrow, suffering, and death itself and lift us up into His presence so that we experience peace and blessing and favor and help. That's why we come to church, and that's why we endure preachers preaching. Hopefully they have heard from God. And what they speak, when God says it, if delivered with the right spirit and seasoned with prayer, it brings power and life to the hearer. All we need is the right word at the right time, spoken in the right way. Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 3. We're not going to take time to read the whole passage. The whole story is from verse 9, chapter 3, 2 Kings, through verse 20. But I'm going to read some excerpts from those verses. While you're turning there, if you want to mark it or write it down, A preacher gave an unusual sermon one day and used a peanut to illustrate several things from the Bible. One of the members greeting him at the close of the service said, Pastor, that was very interesting. I never expected to learn so much from a nut. Now, if the pastor was already feeling offended, he would have taken that personally. But if he was already prepared and thinking about 
he used an illustration of a peanut. It would not have offended him. So we need to prepare ourselves in remembering who we are and who others are around us. Because that word from God could come from even a child that may not even understand what they're saying. There have been many times through the years God has used my own children when they were little, sometimes as they've grown older, and even my grandchildren. They see something, they hear something, and I can remember times they'd come and say, either Daddy or Pappy, I'm praying for you, or remember God loves you, or said something that was in their heart at the moment and we should not look at it as small, insignificant. Because God used roosters, donkeys, worms. He could use us to say something so important and necessary in an urgent moment. So let's look at 2 Kings 3, 9 through 20. Verse 9, so the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah, and the king of Eden, after seven days, the army had no more water. Verse 10, what? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Verse 15, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. Verse 16, and he said, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. Now these are three kings with all of their armies, and they've run out of water. They've been on a seven-day march to go conquer Moab. Seven days away from their homes, away from their supplies, and they're out of water. So they've got livestock for food, livestock to travel on, horses, equipment, all their weapons, themselves and their servants, thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers and livestock, and there's not a drop of water. And Elisha says, the Lord has given me a word. Go out into this valley that's out in front of us and start digging ditches. And he says, you're not going to hear any wind or feel wind, and you're not going to see any rain or clouds. Listen to it. You'll see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. Verse 17. 18. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand Moab over to you. The next morning, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom, that filled the valley. There is power in the Word of God. That's why we need to have a regular conversation with the Lord, and after we have vented and shared and petitioned, that we take time to say, Lord, is there anything you would like to say to me? Because that may be the point where God gives you the answer, the wisdom, and the authority by Him speaking it into you that you can take charge of what's happening in your life. All we need is a word from the Lord. And sometimes God does not speak it Himself. Sometimes He uses others or things, circumstances, signs and wonders to speak to us. Amen? A word from God can turn defeat to victory, despair to joy and peace. Amen? We need to uh, be open to receive the word and not have an attitude that we 
know everything. You've probably never met anyone like that, but I have. Where they not only knew far more than I did, but they knew more than anyone. And there was a fellow that traveled with us when we traveled for the Bible college. And uh, we called him the walking encyclopedia. He knew everything about everything and about everyone. And if you was talking about anything, he would immediately say, oh, I know about that, and he'd start in. And many times, he didn't have a clue. He was bloviating. He was like filling himself with the east wind. And man, could he talk. I mean, he would be so engrossed in talking that everyone could walk away, and he'd still be talking. It was hilarious until it became irritating. Now, we don't have that problem with God. God does not mince words. He does not add a lot of words. Usually, He speaks very briefly, expecting us to hear and to heed what He is saying. So, when we look at Misha, a Moabite vassal king who had rebelled against Joram, son of Ahab, king over Israel, Joram, king of Jehoshaphat of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they were going to fight with Moab. This vassal king, Misha, was facing three armies, marched seven days at the foot of the Dead Sea, a complete desert, super hot, dusty, their throats were parched, their animals were dying. That's the picture. It's amazing how quickly three kings with thousands of trained soldiers ready to whip the king of Moab can stop in their tracks because there's no water. So I want to ask you something. What is it in your life that has stopped you from experience the favor and the blessing of God. Most often, it's a thing or a person. How many can look back and say, things that happened and changed the direction of my life was either a person or a circumstance. Something happened. Did you take time to hear a word from God? knowing that Scripture says He will cause His people to triumph in all their ways. That's why that chorus is so good. God spoke that to Don's heart. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. Amen? We will see the victory won. Why? Because we hold on to the exceeding great and precious promises of God that says He will cause His people to be victorious. And He will never leave us. And He will supply all our needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This we know. Why? Because He said it. And there's truth and power and life in the Word of God. If we step back to inquire of God, Jehoshaphat did what they should have done before starting. We need to inquire of the Lord. At times it seems like the enemy is attacking from every direction. How many feel that way today? <laughs> Maybe he's so busy attacking me you haven't... <laughs> had any problem, so I'll, I'll take it for a while. But I'm willing to share. Sometimes we are confronted above and beneath and every side. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, within us. And He has promised He will not leave us and He will bring us to the place of blessing and victory if we will trust Him and heed his word. 
If we look at verses 15 through 19, it, Elisha said, The Spirit of the Lord has come upon me. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You need to get down in that valley out there and start digging ditches because tomorrow they're going to be full of water. It won't come from rain and the wind's not going to blow it in. So don't be looking for clouds. Just get out there and dig. And as the sun rose, here came water flowing from the direction of Eden that filled the valley. One word from God changes everything. Now I want to say this to you. Because we all go through challenges and tests and trials. Nobody's exempt. In those times, instead of responding, Remember what life, life has said, Job? This is foolishness, what you're doing. Your emotions, your responses, the way you're feeling, your anger, your frustration, saying that you wished you'd never been born in your mother's womb. I cursed the day that I, I was born. Job, that's foolishness. You're upset because of what has happened. You need to remember who you are you are a chosen vessel of God. And remember who God is, one who never leaves nor fails those who trust him. One word from God can change everything. One word from God will make you unsinkable, unbeatable, unshakable, will turn famine into blessing and prosperity, will turn sickness to health, weakness to strength, drought to uh, flood, nothing is too hard for God. Would you, would you venture out and say that with me? There's nothing too hard for our God. One more time. There is nothing too hard for our God. Then let me admonish you. Stop in the time of trouble, at the attack, in the moment, in the season of suffering and difficulty, in the time where there is a siege of the enemy and emotion is running high and deep. It's overwhelming your, your heart and your thoughts and the way you're acting. Put the brakes on and say, Father, help me. Speak a word into my spirit that I can stand unshakable, unmovable, trusting you, believing in you, knowing that your plan is always right. Calm me, Lord. Speak peace to me. Help me to be a part of the miracle. That takes a big person. It takes a spirit-believing, filled person to in the midst of attack, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of dying, in the midst of all things seem to be going wrong, to say, be still my soul. I know God has the answer. Calm down. Speak to me, Lord. Amen, church. Amen, church. One word from God will open closed doors, set the captive free, heal the blind to die, open the deaf ear, make the lame to walk. The Bible's full of when he spoke and when he declared, miracles happened. Signs followed. It was an evidence that my trust is not in what has happened, no matter how tragic or how harsh it is. My confidence is in the Lord and His plan. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, not to hurt you, to harm you, but to bring you to where I have planned you to be in the very end of life. One word. God, calm the storm. Speak peace. 
He didn't get up and preach a three-hour message to the storm and to the demons and to the destruction that was happening. He just said, peace, be still. And what happened? The winds and the waves abated and it was perfect peace. Peace be still because he spoke. Isn't it important to hear from God? But pastor, I'm just so busy. I've got so much going on. I, I just don't have time to pray. I, I just don't have time to be still and, and stop being angry. I don't, just don't have time to, be, to stop being frustrated with life. I just don't. Have, but we do. If we just make the choice. Boy, Job was venting and lamenting and just jumping into the horrible pool of death and destruction. And life has said, what you're doing is folly, it's foolishness. Remember who God is and remember who you are to God. Remember what you've said to us through the years. God's still the same. You're going through a bad place, a horrible place, an unimaginable place, a place I'd never want to be, but I know God has an answer. God has the answer. Would you say that? God has the answer. There's only one way to do this. And this is not fun. How many have ever broke up fallow ground? It's wonderful if you've got good equipment. But if you're out there with a shovel, it is excruciating. And it looks like you make no progress and you're exhausted. But that's where we, the people of God, need to take time to let the Lord speak to us. Hmm? It's kind of like if you've got someone working for you and they walk up to you and say, I'd like for you to examine what I'm doing and be very honest with me. I don't think I've ever heard that in my life. In fact, most of the time, they don't want to even see you or talk to you. But if they would, what would happen eventually is they would become experts at what they do. Because if we're doing it, we're content. How many find that? How many find that when you're doing something, it's pretty easy to get to the place where you say, I think that's good enough. Because in here and in here and in here, you're exhausted. And it's been a lot to do. And you say to yourself, I remember, I don't know who it was, but I remember someone saying, well, that's good enough for the girls I go with. And I, I made, a, made that statement one day in front of Don. <laughs> and she said, well, it's not good enough for me. <laughs> she didn't mince any words. <laughs> But isn't it true we give ourselves permission slips to say, I think that's good enough. I don't think we need to do this the way it ought to be done because I'm tired. I'm at the end of my rope. I've got bigger fish to fry. But I've heard this in Scripture and I've heard this through my life. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And it doesn't matter who you're doing it for but especially if you're doing it for God. And Scripture says, do whatever you do as if it is God. How many have heard that? Do it as unto the Lord. Whatever you do with your life, whatever you do with your time, do it as if it was the Lord there watching you and you were doing it for Him. Why? Because God is going to have the final word.
He not only has the word of miracle and blessing and power, but he has the word of justice and judgment. We need to be very careful that we don't participate in things that are going to bring judgment on somebody's life because how we acted or reacted. Huh? We are peace speakers. Amen? Now I want to tell you this little story and we're going to close. How many have ever heard of Don Triplett? He's one of our most uh, storied and famous missionaries in the Assemblies of God. Been all over the world. He was in El Salvador and he had gone there with a group of workers to try to establish some churches. You know where he began? With children. He knew that if he could get the kids to respond and get them excited, they would go home and tell their parents, and the parents would come to find out what the kids were talking about. I remember many years ago, a young lady was invited outside the church here to come to missionettes. She would just walk through the church property. This has been probably 25 years ago. And invited her to come to church. She was surprised that we would even talk to her, surprised that we'd even let her in the church. She came, got involved in missionettes, gave her heart to the Lord, went home to her dad and mom who did not have any faith. Invited them to come to a missionette meeting that was an honors meeting, recognizing what the girls had accomplished. And as a result, for about three and a half years, they came and became a part of the church. Faithful, even accepted the Lord. Tragically, they fell away from the Lord. But the story is this. You touch a child, and the child can do more in touching a parent than you will ever be able to do. But what was happening, he had about 300 children that had come from the villages nearby in El Salvador. And he didn't know what to do. He had this big tent that he had brought with him. It was as big as a circus tent. The poles that held the center, there was three of them, and they were 30 feet high, side poles all the way around 10 feet high. And he needed strong men. He had himself and the missionary and two adult helpers and over 300 children. They had been working, stretching the tent out and putting the poles in, hooking it to the rings at the top of the net, but they didn't have anyone to help them pick the poles up so that they could let the, everybody around know there's a big tent, there's going to be a big meeting, and the kids got excited and go home, need to come to the meeting tonight. But there were no men, not enough to lift those poles. So he just began to pray. And the Lord told him, teach the children. So he set them all, and he began to teach. Behind him was the tent on the ground, spread out all over this flat area. And he was talking to the children, telling them stories of how Jesus worked miracles and how Jesus loved the children, and he would even let them come and sit on his lap and all the things that Jesus did, and all of the sudden the children started screaming, and, and they pointed at the, at the tent. And what had happened, a wind came, and where they had set the poles, where the entry of the tent was, to be able to get in and work and get things in there, and get it hooked up so they could raise it, went through the doorway, lifted the tent up, and the wind blew so strong that it dragged up those 30-foot poles, set them in place. And the 10-foot poles all the way around. They didn't need any man. God sent the wind. And the kids 
ran screaming and hollering all the way home and told them, you won't believe what happened. A big wind came. There were no men and filled the tent and set the pole. Stories in the evangel. One word from God. He says, I'll speak to the north and the south, the east and the west winds, and it will blow my spirit upon all flesh. But you see, you've got to want to hear it. You've got to realize there are some things that we don't know how to do. And even if we knew how, we wouldn't be able to do it. Things are bigger than we are. They're bigger than me, far bigger than me. The further I've gone, the more small I've found out that I am. But my God, our God, can do anything. He can do everything by the word of his lips his spoken word, and by the power of his spirit. Zechariah says, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He spoke that. If we have the Holy Spirit, he makes all the difference. We're going to read this last verse to you. And then we're going to worship just a little while. Galatians 6, verse 9 through 10. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all. Not just our family, not just our friends, not just the people that we like, but that little word means everyone, all. Everyone. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. How many want to hear from the Lord. If you haven't got your communion, please do so. We're going to take communion here in just a moment. It takes just a little bit to get that cellophane off the top. I've learned to get it loose before church. God doesn't have just one miracle for you. He has miracles every day. And God doesn't just have a plan to help you with what you need. He has a plan to use you mightily to be a blessing to your family and those around you. If you listen with a hungry heart, you're going to hear God tell you some things that will just make you feel so astounded and amazed at how much He loves you and how great things He's going to do if you will follow it. Amen. Let's sing this chorus together. And the honor Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name.
I don't know what it is for everybody, but I can tell you just quickly what it has been for me. Every day, the Lord offers me the opportunity throughout that day to hear what He has to share. All I have to do is take the moment. There's times that literally I've been driving to an appointment and I felt in my heart the Lord said, pull over. Just as clearly if someone had been sitting in the car and said, pull over. And I've learned instead of ignoring that and thinking, well, why would I pull over? I've got to get to this appointment. I've learned that when I feel like the Lord has spoke to me, just do it. Pull over and get out of traffic. And so often the Lord will, not immediately, but as soon as I'm calm and i am got the car turned off and I'm out of traffic, very often the Lord will speak to me. A lot of the time it has to do with the congregation. Something's happening and I need you to pray right now. It's hard to pray effectively when you're trying to navigate a vehicle in traffic. I've done it, but it's hard. You've got to be very careful. But oh, in those moments where the Lord has spoke to me and I can lift my hands in the car and begin to pray in the Spirit. I said, Lord, you spoke to me, you've stopped me. Whatever's happening, I am in agreement with you and I pray for the power and the presence of your Spirit to go immediately to where they are and wrap your arms around them. Let them feel the comfort and peace of your presence. Speak the word to them that they need to hear. And Lord, if there's something you want me to do, tell me. Very often, I feel like he says, you've just done what I needed you to do. Because the Lord says we do not have because we haven't asked. There's power in asking. And there's help and hope in listening. And even if it's just a feeble step, and that's what my steps are. You see me feebly trying to get around on two knees that are giving out. Because of the condition of my body, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to get surgery. But I, I remember years ago, the Lord spoke to me while I here on the platform. Will you serve me if your legs give out on you? I even mentioned it in the service. I said, I just feel like the Lord asked me, what will you do if your legs go out on you? Because that's been probably the strongest part of my physical body has been my legs. Now they are the weakest part. And I remember telling the Lord, I will still do the best that I can do. Right now, the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to you. Just bow your heart before we take communion. I want God to speak to you today so you won't forget it. First Sunday of October 2022, the message was about the power of the Word word power and father we need direction we need help we need wisdom we need you to speak a word into our life maybe it's a word of faith 
that I will actually begin to believe and trust you and start acting like I do. Or maybe I need you to speak the word and break off the chains of my heart. Take away the fear out of my spirit. Maybe there's things that I've been involved in, Lord, through my lifetime. Or maybe I'm getting ready to make a decision that you know would destroy or devastate me. Oh, God, speak the word today. Father, speak the word to your people. Let them hear your voice. Let them feel the nudge of your spirit. Let them know that you have what they need this morning. We receive it, Father. I receive it, Father. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that he had received of the Lord the cup of grape juice that Jesus said was the new covenant in his blood. And the bread that was broken was a symbol of his body that was going to be sacrificed upon the cross. that we might have forgiveness of sin and salvation through Jesus. And Paul said, I give this to you to remind you of what Jesus has done and what that means to you. And he says, examine yourself. And if there's any sin in your life, anything that does not belong there between you and God, ask God to forgive you and to take that away to wash you clean through his blood. Would you just do that right now? Oh, Father, forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness for thy name's sake. Wash us, Lord. Break the chains of sin. Break the curse of sin, the yoke of sin off of every life, out of every heart and mind and soul. Make us clean and worthy as we partake this morning. In Jesus' name, you may partake of the bread together. And then the cup. Thank you, Lord Jesus for giving your life for us, for me. Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness and mercy, for the grace that you give each of us to live our lives. Speak to us and teach us your way, Lord. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, Oh 
share just a quick testimony. Brother George and I were standing out this last week near the end of the afternoon and uh, some of the young people that had been here for uh, a study uh, walked out. One of the young ladies particularly had several significant piercings and different things and hair was all colored and uh, just a rough looking young lady. Uh, very seemed just struggling with her life. And we both happened to notice her. And that evening, uh, Jordan received a call from the girl's father. I think I'm getting the story right. And he wanted to verify that she had been here at the church. She went home and told him, he said, where have you been? I was at church at a Bible study. And he said, I am calling because I want to find out the truth. Was she there? And Jordan says, well, yes. And he said, really? And there was quiet, and he says, that would be the last place I thought she would ever be. Jordan talked to him for a little bit, and he began to cry over the phone. Expressed, I am so thankful. Maybe there's hope. To me, that is a miracle. Does anything happen in this little fellowship every day? I had something that really has helped my heart Friday night to have the superintendent of Cochise County School System come and her first words she introduced herself talked about her seven children 21 grandchildren and one great grandchild but she said above all this I am a servant of the most high God and the Lord said that's for you to give you hope that I have people everywhere. When educators and education is suffering and trying to be destroyed and void of truth, here the superintendent of Cochise County Schools went through a day that tried to keep her from coming, that she could tell the kids and the leaders there, I am a servant of the Most High God. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I am the Cochise County School Superintendent, but I am a servant of God. What a miracle. And her testimony and her sharing of who she was and what she did, and, and she was determined to please the Lord. I could go on for hours and tell you the different things that happened, but just take that with you today and realize that we are not insignificant. Where any even two get together and believe and wait on God, miracles can happen. And I pray that God will give you many miracles today and through this coming week. That you will see the hand of God, hear the voice of God, and feel the strength of God in your life more than you've ever felt it before. That's my prayer for you as you leave today. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Hope we see you again soon. Tonight, prayer at 5 o'clock, and we hope to have you here for a time of prayer and worship. God bless you.